welcome to another episode of Geo Stance. Today with us, we have a very special guest, the former Foreign Secretary of India, Mr. Kaval Sibbal, who's also been an ambassador to many important countries. Thank you so much for being on Geo Stance today, sir. My pleasure. Welcome My pleasure. Let's start with the CAA, sir, because it's just come up. The government of India notified the implementation of the law yesterday. And ever since then, we've seen disinformation flowing in from different quarters. One, of course, is uh, political parties at home. That was much expected. Uh, of course, there is also disinformation flowing in from Pakistan. We'll come to that later. Uh, but I was also seeing some of your reactions on X, the former Twitter, uh, where I saw you interacting with some accounts from the West. And um, we see that uh, the Western media is, as usual, spinning some narratives which are far from the truth. We also saw some self-proclaimed um, activists or enforcers of democracy saying that this law is very anti-Muslim because we've left the Ahmadiyas or the LGBT community, who you know, people from that community who may be struggling in Pakistan, and we are not taking them in. So my first question to you is, uh, is it India's lookout to look after people who were proponents of uh, the two nation theory, the do Qomi Nazaria or the idea of Pakistan, now that the state has turned against them? Uh, is it our lookout to look after them as to what happens to Muslims in Pakistan post partition? See, a couple of things. One is that if there is a kind of a sectarian strife in Pakistan, a Shia, Sunnis, or MDRs, or there's some kind of a social strife uh, where they don't accept LGBT community. It's not the same thing as a persecution of uh, Hindus in Pakistan or in Afghanistan or in Bangladesh, because that's a legacy of the two nation theory and the partition. And as we all know, while the Muslim population in India has grown six times uh, since 1947, the Hindu population in Pakistan has been effectively decimated. And uh, in Bangladesh too, in percentage wise, there's a very, very uh, major drop in terms of uh, the Hindu population of uh, Bangladesh. There's the whole concept of kafirs and uh, uh, jihad and everything else. But that is not uh, relevant uh, to what is happening inside Pakistan. Now, those who want to criticize India that uh, our uh, CA is discriminatory against uh, the Muslims should answer a couple of questions. First, while the Hindus uh, have, uh, and Jan Sikhs and all, you know, it's all uh, included in the definition of Hindus, uh, they have actually sought shelter in India, but have any Andhyas sought shelter in India or the LGBT community sought shelter in India? Uh, there are 49 countries with a Muslim majority in the world. Uh, they are all open to people who want to leave Pakistan or Bangladesh or Afghanistan and uh, seek asylum there or seek shelter there. Uh, but where do the Hindus go? I mean, even in the case of the UK, and some of their activists have been active on X, uh, even when it comes to Indian professionals, uh, they don't want to uh, give any uh, uh, concessions on that. They want to be pretty rigid. And this is one of the reasons why the FTA is not moving forward. Leave aside uh, people uh, who would want to seek uh, asylum or shelter in the uh, United States, in the UK. Uh, they don't want even to accept uh, legally legal migrants who are professionals uh, who can contribute to their economies. Now, if they are so concerned about uh, uh, giving asylum to Muslims or giving refuge to uh, Muslims, then uh, they should get the Rohingyas in large numbers. What they are doing is they are giving money to Bangladesh to look after the Rohingyas in the refugee camps where they live in very dire conditions. Why don't they have a law where they give fast track their entry into Great Britain? Remember what happened when Idi Amin uh, uh, expelled uh, Indians from uh, Uganda. Britain did, didn't want to accept them, although they were holding British overseas passports. Uh, 
Uh, they wanted a two-stage process where a lot of them first came to India. And then over time, in a staggered way, they were accepted into Britain. Uh, so uh, that is one uh, aspect of it. The other is that if uh, they have problems with Pakistan maltreating its, uh, um, sector, its uh, Shias or MDRs or what have you, then call out Pakistan. Ask them to behave better. Internationalize the issue. Shame Pakistan. So why are we being asked to bear the burden of Pakistan's sins? Uh, so there's a lot of hypocrisy and double speak. Now, you know, some of these activists, I talk about the Indian ones later abroad, uh, especially in Britain, they're being pushed by Islamic lobbies there. Uh, they have uh, people who support them in various ways and they become the spokesman of, of those <coughs> lobbies. And you'll see how multiculturalism in the UK is failing very badly. Uh, even to take the case of the United States, they are be becoming very tough uh, on uh, immigration from Mexico and everything else. And here there's no question of a partition and kafir and business of uh, jihad and uh, treating another uh, set of people as kafirs and uh, what are idol worshippers and all that. So countries uh, take measures to make sure that uh, uh, they, they don't have an open border that anybody persecuted anywhere uh, comes into your, your country. And the final thing is that uh, you can't have uh, two contradictory positions. One, that minorities in India are unsafe. And then you want Muslims to come to India. I mean, just make up your mind whether Muslims in India are safe. If they are safe, accept that. And then we go to the next step. But if you keep saying that uh, minorities are being persecuted and not safe in India, uh, then, then clearly the logic, logical conclusion from this is that no Muslim, however much he may feel uh, targeted in, in his own country, would not want to come to India. He would like to go elsewhere. Now, when it comes to Indians, uh, you know, this is uh, being raised into an issue deliberately of uh, secularism. That uh, since India is becoming Hindu and the Hindu uh, philosophy uh, is gaining ground with the BJP and this and that. So they want to create this impression uh, that uh, the Muslims are being persecuted. Uh, and this is one more instance where they are being persecuted. But they forget the fact that, first of all, uh, the cutoff date is 2014. Now we are 2024. That means that in the 10 years after that, if any Hindu, Sikh, Jain, Buddhist, Christian has come to India, CAA uh, is not applicable. They have to follow the normal route of acquiring uh, citizenship. This is only to treat those people who have come in the past and are living in very miserable conditions because they don't have Indian nationality. Uh, they can't uh, have the benefits uh, that the government of India is giving uh, as welfare uh, to a certain class of people in India. So therefore, I think uh, it is to help them settle down, uh, have identity, proper identity, proper documentation, avail of all the facilities government of India is giving, find jobs and everything else. So this is a humanitarian thing that government of India has done. Since there's a backlog, they're clearing it. Right. You're right. In fact, there was a survey in the UK recently ran by a very popular uh, news uh, media outlet. Um, and the results were astonishing, to say the least. Majority of Brits want immigrants, especially Muslims, uh, you know, out of Britain because they feel that they are a threat to their democratic values. In fact, Rishi Sunak also made a very impassioned speech like a couple of weeks ago. Okay, let's talk about Pakistan now. An impression is being given um, by Pakistan as well as their allies in um, you know, the Gulf, uh, particularly Al Jazeera. They've also spread a lot of disinformation since yesterday. Now the Pakistanis also say that this law is anti-Muslim. My question to you is based on this particular argument that it is the idea of Pakistan, the two nation theory uh, in spirit, which has caused this persecution of Hindus. 
uh, in Pakistan because the, the very creation of Pakistan was an act of Hindu phobia. What does the two nation theory say? It says that the Hindus and Muslims cannot live together. They are two different nations. Now, it was more than obvious that no matter what Jinnah says on one particular day on 11th of August, saying you're free to go to your temples and Gurdwaras. But the fact is that Pakistan was created, uh, you know, on the notion, based on the notion of Islamofascism. And it was only uh, obvious that the minorities there would never have uh, safety. Now, how is this not aligned with the idea of Pakistan? We are pretty much, uh, you know, this this law is pretty much an extension of the Nehru Liaquat Pact, where we decided that uh, if the Hindus from that side want to come back, they can always come back. So, you know, what uh, uh, local standi the Pakistanis have here to say that this is anti-Muslim? For that, they first need to agree uh, that the two nation theory is a bogus theory. Uh, the Hindus and Muslims can live together. Second, if they don't want to say that, um, then uh, let them accept that India is a safe place for Muslims, like you said, because they keep fervently you know, raising this point on international forums that India is committing genocide in Muslims. Then why do they want the Muslims to come to this side? First of all, we need not take what they say seriously. Uh, they have lost all credibility themselves. Uh, it's a different matter. They still are protected uh, by the Western powers and as well as China uh, with regard to how they are managing their internal affairs. Uh, there's a lot of human cry by it, uh, by the United States Commission for International Religious Freedoms when it comes to targeting India. But look at the blasphemy laws in Pakistan. Uh, I, I don't see that kind of a, uh, th that kind of a, uh, you know, taking Pakistan uh, or showing the mirror to Pakistan and uh, exposing uh, Pakistan's uh, terrible uh, internal uh, treatment uh, of uh, Christians uh, and others. Now look at uh, all the Hindu girls, minor girls, uh, who are being abducted and and uh, forcefully forcibly married uh, to Pakistani Muslims. There is no hue and cry. I don't see the New York Times or the Washington Post writing articles on this. Uh, but there is this kind of uh, uh, ingrained uh, hostility, uh, you know, antagonism towards India uh, in the Western press, in the liberal Western press. And therefore, they pick up on all these issues uh, to demean India. And in this, of course, <laughs> our own people, uh, sections of our own people are very active participants. They are the ones uh, who have been talking about the persecution of Muslims, uh, saying CA is anti-Muslim. I don't know how it is anti-Muslim. Uh, they are the ones who have been talking about fascism and uh, stuff like that. And some pretty reputable uh, people uh, on the opposition side in the Congress have been writing and speaking at international forums. Uh, a lot of academicians, leftist liberal types, Leftists combined with liberals have been holding uh, seminars in the United States and elsewhere. Uh, some of the opposition leaders go to various British universities and talk in the same vein. So a narrative has been uh, created, which lets, off, lets Pakistan off the hook and, and, and targets India. And the reason is, A, for our own internal opposition, they don't want, us, they don't want the BJP to succeed. They don't want a strong government uh, at the center. And they want uh, somehow to bring back to power in some way or the other. That, and so far as the Western guys are concerned, uh, they see the Indian uh, fault lines and they want to uh, uh, exploit them to the extent possible uh, because that gives them a handle uh, to lecture to India and interfere in, in India's internal affairs and not allow uh, the present government especially to consolidate the uh, masses behind a certain vision of India, which they don't like. They, they like a kind of a fluid vision of India, which is neither here nor there, which makes India internally weak. And that, of, of course, then affects the foreign policy. You, you can't be internally weak and have a strong foreign policy. If you're internally strong, we'll have a strong foreign policy. So this doesn't suit many of the elements. But coming back uh, abroad, but coming back to uh, uh, Pakistan, 
Um, I saw in the press, I don't know if it is true or not, that uh, Shehbaz Sharif says that they'll have their own CAA and uh, they will, uh, uh, under which uh, Muslims who are persecuted in India uh, can go back to Pakistan and Pakistan will receive them. Very good idea. Excellent idea. Excellent idea. But uh, we find that uh, uh, Muslims uh, from Bangladesh especially uh, keep coming to India in large numbers. Uh, Rohingyas have also come into India. In fact, uh, we have the opposite thing. One narrative is that India is not safe for Muslims who are being persecuted. And the reality is that more and more Muslims are coming into India. And we are not able to control that flow uh, because of uh, the problems we have in West Bengal. Uh, so there it is. Uh, so, so this narrative, I think, of Pakistan uh, about uh, Muslims in India being persecuted and Al Jazeera picking this up. After all, Qatar uh, has very strong links with the Muslim Brotherhood. Mm. Uh, don't forget that uh, they hosted the Taliban and still host the Taliban. They host Hamas. Mm. Uh, so their credentials, whatever other uh, importance they may have in terms of gas supplies to India and stuff like that, uh, I think they're pretty controversial when it comes to their uh, conduct as an Islamic nation. Right. Uh, but just to set the record straight, I mean, that Shehbaz Sharif did not uh, uh, post that tweet. It's one of our guys at work, you know, not uh, Is that doing so? so. Yeah, yeah, he didn't tweet that. But then I wanted to ask you that that would be a win-win situation for India, right? Uh, if they were to actually do that in the sense it that... A, it, had blue, it had a blue tick, the Shehbaz Sharif thing. So this is what happens, right? People can create screenshots, you know. So oh, I, we do, you know, all the time, both the sides to take pot shots at each other. So that he didn't tweet that. But I still wanted to ask you this, that, uh, you know, wouldn't it make sense for Pakistan to actually come up with its own version of CAA? It would also lend uh, legitimacy to its allegations abroad that it keeps making on all international forums that the Indian Muslims or the Muslim Muslim Indians are facing a genocide. They've been saying it for like, you know, Look, forever. Uh, this is a bit of a joke. Look, how many uh, Afghans have they sent back, Afghan refugees, who actually have settled down in Pakistan uh, for a long time. And uh, in fact, had found jobs, had settled down, married, had families. Uh, many of them actually don't even uh, speak Pashto, they speak Urdu. But 400,000 or more have been pushed back by Pakistan. And what about all the uh, action, all the military action they have taken in Wazir, North Waziristan, South Waziristan, in, in, that, uh, in, the, in the border areas of uh, Afghanistan, Pakistan? They have let loose their military in the past, the air force in the past, the number of Muslims uh, they have killed. And what about the killings that have been taking, are still taking place? Look at the way they are treating the Baloch, the kind of discrimination. They are Muslims, aren't they? I mean, so Pakistan has absolutely no credibility in terms of uh, being the spokesman for Muslims when they are treating their own Muslims in such a uh, cruel manner by unleashing their military force against them, throwing out uh, refugees in large numbers. And you haven't seen an outcry by the UN High Commissioner for Refugees. If we do something, uh, they're very quick <laughs> to react. But I haven't seen, I do follow the news, I haven't seen any, any strong condemnation by the UN Secretary General or the UN High Commissioner for Refugees or the UN Human Rights Commissioner about the terrible things that are happening where the refugees are being lock, stock and barrel uprooted uh, from Pakistan and sent back uh, to nothing in Afghanistan because they have no longer any roots there. I mean, some organizations did react, but then it was only to the extent of just reacting online and, you know, reprimanding them saying, don't do this. But then they still did um, throw, you know, uh, no, lax no. to, to the wolves. Look, look, the army chief, any the present army chief, when he went to the uh, United States, he met the UN Secretary General. Why should Absolutely. the Pakistan army chief meet the UN Secretary General? Apart from the fact that he met uh, all the senior leaders uh, in the Pentagon and in the, in the State Department. In mm -hmm. fact, this was, in a sense, uh, validating uh, the control of the military 
over democracy in Pakistan. Uh, so uh, if they made some pro pharma remarks here and there, <laughs> it doesn't mean anything. But in terms of actual policies, uh, they are still very supportive of Pakistan. True. I mean, it would have been really interesting if they came up with that law, because I'm sure even the Gazans will balk at the uh, possibility of relocating to Pakistan, let alone uh, Muslims from India. Um, all right. So now we talk about Afghanistan, an Indian delegation uh, led by J.P. Singh met the Taliban foreign minister recently. And it wasn't covered in the Indian media so much, but then the Pakistanis again are you know, going crazy about it. So um, the Indian side's version was that we spoke about the humanitarian assistance that we've given to Afghans um, in, in the past uh, you know, a couple of years, plus the use of Chabahar port by Afghan traders. When I read the Afghan readout, it basically says that we discussed security and trade both. So uh, I see that difference that in our version, the security part didn't really make it to the final readout, but there's, uh, their readout um, did speak about it. So if uh, we talk about security, what exactly do we mean by that? Are we trying to leverage uh, Taliban you know, uh, to our advantage in terms of tackling terrorism in Pakistan or preventing Afghanistan from hosting anti-India uh, terror organizations, which we've been hearing in the past couple of years that many of them have moved bases to Afghanistan now. Well, uh, first of all, uh, we are uh, continuing our humanitarian aid uh, to uh, Afghanistan as uh, is required uh, because we have uh, how many, two, three billion dollars of investment in uh, Afghanistan before the Taliban took over. And these are small, some big, but a lot of small projects spread across the territory, including at that time, Taliban controlled territory, which the Taliban were not oppo opposing because they were do doing good to the people of those areas. So we want to continue that. A lot of Afghan students uh, are, are uh, being educated in India. Uh, more of them want to come. Uh, we have been a little tight on this score, uh, but uh, I'm sure that after proper scrutiny, uh, we are allowing them uh, to come. Then there are Afghan uh, students here uh, who have families back home, so they have to travel back and forth. So some mechanism has to be found in order to facilitate that. On top of that, the Afghan embassy in New Delhi is non-functional uh, because the consulates are apparently functional, but the embassy is non-functional because uh, uh, there is an issue of who appoints them and who they uh, give allegiance to, since we haven't recognized uh, the Taliban government, so we can't accept the credentials uh, of any Afghan ambassador or Afghan diplomats uh, which are appointed there formally uh, by the Taliban government. So there are all these complicated uh, diplomatic issues we have to handle, but we are keeping in mind uh, the need for humanitarian assistance given the very difficult situation that exists in Afghanistan. We've sent a lot of wheat, as you know, uh, uh, to Afghanistan and uh, medicine. Uh, Afghanistan, they don't have the necessary resources to buy these things. And there have been reports of, uh, um, you know, shortages of various kinds, including of uh, food. That's one aspect. The other is the security aspect, uh, where we've always had concerns and those probably haven't gone away. Uh, that uh, um, Afghan, Afghanistan uh, can become a base of uh, some of the uh, fundamentalists, especially if not the Taliban, uh, the, the ISIS-related uh, elements, uh, who are also apparently targeting <laughs> the Taliban, they could become uh, a source of problems for us. And therefore, we have to think in terms of uh, some kind of a dialogue with the Taliban, uh, which would uh, uh, give us assurance that the Taliban government in uh, Kabul uh, will try and uh, prevent uh, such uh, terrorist activity directed uh, at India. Uh, 
after all, don't forget that people like Haqqani, uh, who are still in charge of the uh, of the internal security, these were the ones uh, who were very much uh, linked with the terrorist acts against India. For the moment, they seem to be under some kind of a control uh, because the uh, the Taliban spiritual leader uh, is, uh, is still exerting uh, control over these elements. But we have to see uh, the danger down the road. And finally, given the fact that uh, Pakistan's uh, larger strategy in Afghanistan has miserably failed, and the TTP, which has uh, which is located now on Afghan soil, is carrying out major terrorist attacks against Pakistan. And Pakistan is terribly frustrated uh, because of this. Uh, they want uh, the Afghan government, the Taliban government, to hand over or suppress the TTP. But I am told by the, some of the senior leaders uh, of the old regime, uh, whom I, one of them whom I met a, just a few weeks ago, uh, that uh, there is no way that uh, the Afghan government, Taliban government will hand over TTP uh, or cooperate with Pakistan against the TTP because it is the TTP which gave very valuable assistance to Taliban to take over Afghanistan. So they are beholden to them. And then it's part of their culture. They never gave up uh, Osama bin Laden. They're not going to give up the TTP uh, leadership. So this creates uh, uh, for us an opportunity because there, are, there is a serious lift uh, now between the Taliban and, and the Pakistan military regime. Pakistan, uh, whose entire strategy uh, has failed. Uh, so to the extent that uh, this can give us some openings uh, in terms of stabilizing uh, our security concerns, uh, I think we should uh, take them and hence maybe uh, the Joint Secretary of Pakistan uh, Afghanistan, Iran, who went and talked to the Taliban, was part of that exercise uh, to, to maintain a kind of a dialogue with the Taliban. Keeping also in mind that the only country which has formally recognized Taliban is China. And uh, China wants to bring Afghanistan into its uh, orbit, uh, want to exploit its natural resources. Uh, so we have to keep that factor in mind. Uh, by ensuring that we don't turn our backs entirely uh, to the Taliban leadership and play this delicate game of engaging them without formally recognizing them. I mean, the Taliban are extending some hollow uh, assurances to the Pakistanis saying the TTP will not attack you from our soil anymore. But then the TTP has started a whole new thing. They are now operating under different names so that they can always have that plausible deniability and say, okay, this is not us. But then the attacks are continuing. Okay, so uh, let's go to Saudi Arabia now. I mean, I'm jumping from one uh, location to another, but then I want to make uh, use of your experience and talk about as many things as I can. Uh, we saw that Saudi Arabia very recently hosted uh, its first ever non-Muslim delegation. And it was an Indian delegation um, to the holy city of Medina led by a woman, which underscores the exceptional relationship which India has forged uh, with you know, Saudi Arabia and many countries in the Gulf region. How did we do that? Because Pakistan has always uh, played a foiler to India's relationship with the Muslim world at large. But then in the recent years, we've seen the kind of diplomacy um, that's been done by India in the region and particularly the personal touch of Prime Minister Modi uh, has played a huge role, so to say. How, how did we come this far? And in, in such a short period of time? Uh, you know, the foundation of this was laid uh, by the previous government when Manmohan Singh visited Saudi Arabia. So there were tentative steps in that direction. Uh, but uh, under uh, uh, Mohammed, uh, Mohammed bin Salman, uh, things have changed dramatically in Saudi Arabia. One is, of course, the manner in which we have engaged Saudi Arabia uh, and Prime Minister's own uh, role in, in this regard uh, in, uh, in, in, in reaching out uh, to the Saudi 
uh, crown prince. Uh, even when the United States President Biden was declaring him a pariah, uh, we were embracing him. Uh, so, but had, if it were not for uh, for him and the, and the way he wants to modernize uh, Saudi Arabia, we wouldn't have been able to make this uh, breakthrough with that country. Now he wants to de-radicalize -re -re uh, Saudi Arabia. He wants to give women the rights which were denied to them uh, in the past. He wants to uh, move away from Wahhabism. He's controlling that element in uh, Saudi society. He has major plans to uh, develop uh, Saudi Arabia into a modern economy. They see down the road that oil, they can't rely on their oil resources uh, to maintain their prosperity uh, because the trends because of climate change and other reasons are that oil will still be important as a resource, but will not be critical in, in terms of uh, uh, Saudi's future. And therefore, they have, he has this 2030 vision where he wants to develop this neom, which will actually uh, compete with uh, Singapore as a very advanced, technical, technologically advanced entertainment uh, tourist uh, destination uh, in, in, in the Red Sea. Uh, in the northwestern part of Saudi Arabia. He can't do this. For this, huge investments are needed. He can't do this unless he has peace and stability. And uh, the rest of the world feels comfortable. Just as the UAE has modernized itself, we just saw the Hindu temple being built there. Uh, Saudi Arabia is following in the same direction. And part of this is why they have actually now uh, found accommodation with Saudi, with uh, Iran, because they know that if uh, that relationship is not stabilized, then foreign investors will always shy away because they will all always fear that things can blow up. Uh, so to answer your question, uh, we've had major success, not as much as with the UAE, because Saudi Arabia still has a different persona, uh, but uh, the opportunities that have been provided by uh, the manner in which uh, Mohammed bin Salman wants to uh, modernize uh, Saudi Arabia and also develop uh, uh, bilateral ties and a couple of other reasons. Uh, one, of course, is that uh, uh, India is becoming a very important element in terms of Indian Ocean security. Uh, you know, our military chiefs, uh, Army chief has visited Saudi Arabia. He went and addressed the Saudi military. Uh, with UAE, we are uh, uh, we have defense understandings and we want to build on them. Uh, Oman has given us access to the Dukam port. Uh, our Navy regularly visits uh, these areas. Joint exercises have been held with the uh, UAE and this and that. So, uh, in this perspective, uh, Saudi Arabia is attaching importance to India as also a potential security partner in the Indian Ocean area. Uh, the second is that uh, for Saudi Arabia, the moment is very uh, opportune when our relations with Iran are, 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 are not developing as the way they could have and should have, but for US sanctions and everything else. So this gives him an opportunity to tie us down with Saudi Arabia as much as possible in the larger regional competition uh, with uh, Iran. And finally, they also know, in, as the West knows, India rising economy, fifth largest economy, third largest by 2027, this third largest importer of uh, uh, oil in the world, uh, which will need more energy as it grows, uh, market next door, and hence purely pragmatically, uh, they want to uh, have links with the Indian market and benefit from India's economic growth. And the Arabs are very pragmatic in this regard. And hence this Pakistan factor, Muslim Islamic factor that has receded into the background. They are cooperating with, cooperating with us on the issue of terrorism very effectively. So how do you make sense of the reforms that MBS is, you know, uh, making 
you already mentioned um, oil, of course, which is fast depleting. And, you know, there is a larger demand for cleaner energy res uh, resources. And that's why Qatar is so excited about it. Uh, you know, while MBS is making a lot of reforms, and he's also facing a lot of crit criticism for that, especially from uh, the Muslims from the Indian subcontinent. They're saying that he's diluting Islam and, you know, he, he can no more be the custodian of Islam. Uh, but then there is also criticism um, around his whole reformist agenda in the sense that uh, he's, he's still not tolerating any sort of dissent. So do you think these are just cosmetic measures, uh, you know, which are arising out of basically fast depleting uh, oil wells, or there are some real intentions to it of actually reforming um, Saudi Arabia? Two, three things. One, I don't think that the oil wells are depleting. Uh, of course, uh, uh, Aramco's, uh, uh, how much uh, wealth, oil wealth is there in this, under the Saudi soil? Uh, uh, and what are the reserves that Aramco has? Uh, that would be top secret. Uh, but uh, I think uh, from all uh, available information, uh, Saudi Arabia is still the most low cost producer of oil and hence it still uh, has a lot of clout in, uh, in OPEC because it can increase and uh, decrease uh, its production uh, of oil uh, much quicker than anybody else. Uh, so uh, I'm not very sure if uh, the depleting oil the resources is any factor in this uh, modernization thing. Uh, secondly, the kind of steps that he has taken in a society like uh, uh, Saudi Arabia, where uh, uh, even small things like he has done, where women uh, can drive the car. And now he has said recently that uh, under the Sharia, men can wear what they want, and so can women wear what they want. So he is also. Uh, open to the idea of women dressing as they please, uh, not not the way the Western women dress themselves, but nevertheless, not the way that Iranian women are compelled to wear uh, the scarf and stuff like that. Uh, then they need not be accompanied by male members uh, where, when they uh, go out. Uh, look at the manner in which yoga is accepted in uh, Saudi Arabia. They don't buy this nonsense that yoga and Om are sort of Hindu and stuff like that. There's an open mind uh, towards that. And what you mentioned earlier, uh, allowing a, a delegation from India to visit uh, uh, Madina. Uh, these are these are more than symbolic. And then the, the women are now very active in the workforce in uh, in Saudi Arabia. In fact, if I remember rightly. Uh, when Modi visited Saudi Arabia, he had gone to uh, some company or whatever else, uh, which was run by women. And so, uh, so I think uh, what I had at one time thought was that there will be a backlash in terms of uh, the clergy in, uh, in uh, Saudi Arabia, the Wahhabis and all that. But uh, he's made sure that uh, he is, uh, uh, they are under control. But not only he, not only they are under control, the manner in which he dealt with the, all the princes, put them in a hotel, put them in effectively in a, in a hotel, but it's sort of a prison and extorted billions of dollars uh, from them and put them in their place. Uh, I, I, if the idea is that Saudi Arabia is going to become a democracy like the Western democracy, no. But uh, by remaining autocratic, uh, but within that uh, uh, autocratic uh, system, uh, changing the way they look at uh, Islam and radical Islam, and the spread of Islam, uh, which Saudi Arabia was very active uh, after the oil crisis in the 1970s when they had a lot of money. That phase is, uh, that phase is over. That phase is over. So I don't think it's problematic. It is real, and that is unsettling uh, countries like uh, uh, Turkey and uh, Malaysia, uh, and, and uh, I'm sure Pakistan, and some of the uh, conservatives in India 
uh, whose world is collapsing around them because the custodian of the two holy mosques is giving a direction to Islam, which is totally contrary uh, to what uh, not only they believe in, but what they want to propagate uh, and uh, what they translate into actual, uh, how should I say, fundamentalist beliefs of all kinds, suppression of women, a refusal to oppose any, any changes that we want to make in terms of uh, uh, Muslim, Muslim laws in the country, resistance that we have seen to some of the changes government has tried to introduce and now of course the uniform uh, civil code yes, and stuff like that. So, you know, for them it is very, very unsettling. Very unsettling when the, when the uh, source of radicalization of Islam, the Wahhabism of Islam, is changing tack, so, so they really don't know uh, how to adjust to this new reality. Right. Let's talk about China now. Uh, so there is a reaction which has come in from Global Times. It says that Indian media's reference of the latest MIRV tech success to China can be seen as India currying favor from the West in its competition with China. Truth be told, China is not very concerned about the improvement of India's military capabilities because this improvement does not constitute a trend of India's military power surpassing China. So my first question to you is, if they're not concerned, why is that they are issuing so many statements? We also that's what send... I, that's what I said on X, the, the yeah. fact that found it fit to... On the one hand, they say they're not concerned. And if they're right. not concerned, they have ignored it. But they are right. actually, by issuing this, they're expressing their concern. And then they are actually twisting the whole thing. Uh, mm -hmm. They have not done their homework. You know, the Americans have been, I was serving in Washington, and I know as foreign secretary, uh, they were trying to uh, stop us from developing a missile program. Uh, in fact, the MTCR uh, was created largely uh, to prevent India's uh, missile program from developing. Uh, they were always very conscious that if India went ahead and developed its missile program, then uh, Pakistan will become vulnerable. And this, this will uh, destabilize the strategic stability in, in South Asia. Uh, but India just went ahead. Uh, I know the kind of pressure we were put in when we developed first the Prithvi missiles. Uh, they, they've always, until recently, they were quiet on this. Uh, they, they've been uh, against India developing ICBM capability because an ICBM ca capability will actually bring, uh, if it is 10,000 kilometers, then you can see the uh, which part of the world can be covered by India's ICBM capability. So they have not been very supportive. So, that, so for Chinese uh, global times to say this totally idiotic thing, that this is to impress the United States when the United States is not fully happy that India is developing these independent uh, capabilities, which in the past they tried to stop, shows that they just don't do their homework. They, they just uh, rattle off whatever uh, line is given to them from the top and engage in this uh, uh, blatant uh, uh, propaganda. Rather, I'll put it differently, they swallow their own pro propaganda without any uh, discernment. Uh, then, of course, we don't need to develop capabilities which are larger than those of China. After all, China doesn't have the same capability as the United States, and they won't have it for a long time. Uh, similarly, uh, France, which talks about strategic uh, autonomy and everything else, it has a relatively small uh, strategic capability, but they think it's enough. In fact, our whole concept, our entire concept of a minimum deterrent is a French concept. We want a minimum deterrence. And our minimum deterrence would be complete when we have seaborne capability with longer range missiles and what we have done now, the MERV capability of our Agni 5. Uh, so it's, it, it is a deterrent. It is, it, is, it is a deterrence. It increases the deterrence uh, uh, with the China. And that's it. We, we have no ambition to. Uh, to compete with China in terms of developing the same level of 
uh, capabilities is not necessary. We can live with asymmetry so long as we can, in a situation, if it becomes utterly necessary, uh, signal to China that we have a capacity to inflict unacceptable damage uh, to on them. We recently sent uh, reinforcements along the border with China. Uh, this is this business as usual, or do we see a threat? Im, you know, immediate threat. No, I think uh, there's a little bit of uh, confusion on this. Uh, what we really I understand have done is that uh, the three independent brigades that are in this region uh, they are being merged together, or at least the intention is to merge them together. And the total numbers would be what have been said in the press. Uh, so it's not a question of uh, an additional 10,000 plus uh, forces, but existing forces combined together which make the number 10,000. And therefore, uh, they'll be in a better position to protect the central sector uh, where uh, China makes incursions. Uh, but uh, relatively speaking, the situation there is more stable than in Ladakh or in uh, uh, Sikkim or Arunachal Pradesh. Uh, so uh, I think this there is a bit of a misreporting uh, on this. Uh, but yes, uh, from our foreign minister's statements, and he repeats them on every occasion, that uh, we can't have normal relations with China uh, so long as the situation on the border is not normal. And he also acknowledges that uh, China does not seem to be in a mood uh, to de-escalate and move the forces back to their peacetime uh, locations. He sees no sign of that. And as we understand from uh, Chinese think tanks and others who repeat what they are told uh, by the Communist Party, that uh, after having made some adjustments in the military to military talks, uh, they're not going to make any further adjustments in Debsan or in Demchok. And that's it. That their objective uh, of, uh, uh, you know, uh, enforcing on the ground their vision of the 1959 line of actual control has been achieved. Uh, so I think it will be a long haul. Uh, the uh, After the latest statement that China has made, after our Prime Minister visited uh, Arunachal to open the Sela Tunnel, uh, pretty aggressive. Um, shows that uh, uh, China is in uh, no mood to uh, settle issues with India. And the hypocrisy of this is that it wants to present itself as a global peacemaker. Uh, they take pride that we have settled uh, the situation between Saudi Arabia and Iran. And now they want to settle it between Russia and Ukraine uh, on this peace mission, even as they do what they're doing with us. Plus, they are battering away at the poor Philippines, uh, and they are bullying uh, Bhutan, and they are doing what they are doing in the South China Sea and the East China Sea. Total hypocrisy, uh, but they are not being called out. Uh, called out in the manner in which they should be, because uh, they have economic force. And this is something which uh, uh, makes Europe and even the United States uh, careful in terms of raising the temperatures and tensions with China. Right. My last question to you is, who are the Americans to us? Friends, enemies, frenemies, or friends with benefits, or we just can't decide? Because it's coming from a place of mistrust. Uh, the Americans seem to be very soft on, on the Khalistani separatists who are flourishing in America. I mean, Canada, is, it was always expected. Uh, the politics there is such that uh, they need to curry favor with them. But uh, why is America doing it? Is, it an, is there an underlying plan here to basically leverage uh, the Khalistani separatist elements against India in order to exploit its fault lines the way the Americans did it in Afghanistan, you know? Uh, use the Taliban to basically create issues. What exactly are, are they thinking of doing with these people? Are, aren't these people also a threat to America in the near future? No, I would describe our relationship with America as uh, 
reasonably good friends with benefits. Because if you take everything in totality at the level of the government, after all, we've dealt with several uh, American presidents from Bush uh, to Obama uh, to Trump uh, to Biden, and the relationship has grown with every president. There's bipartisan consensus on good relationship with India in the US Congress. The US is conscious of the fact that uh, India is a rising power, both economically and otherwise. And now with our leadership in inverted commas of the global south, uh, we've become uh, more useful in their eyes in terms of uh, ensuring that uh, when the world moves toward multipolarity or when these issues are being addressed, uh, India will not be hostile. India will be, will, India will engage constructively. India will protect its interests, would like to have more of a say in global governance. Uh, if it can, become a permanent member of the, the UN Security Council. Uh, and in any case, try and shape the emerging uh, world order, if you like, uh, rather than simply uh, being made to accept what the G7 and others uh, want to do. Or for that matter, what uh, China now with the support of Russia, may want to do in terms of shaping the world order in accordance with its priorities and interests. So the United States realizes that India has a role to play and being in the democratic camp, uh, India is a useful partner. And at the people to people level, there's tremendous uh, uh, empathy between India and United States. Our diaspora there is a uh, is doing extremely well and is contributing a great deal to U.S. Uh, national life. You can see that uh, in terms of trust building, we've gone ahead and uh, bought uh, about $20, $22 billion worth of advanced uh, platforms uh, from the uh, United States. And this on the assumption that uh, while we, are, we know what the United States did to us in the past, that the levels of trust have gone up. And this whole business about the initiative of, for, for uh, uh, emerging and critical technologies uh, that uh, uh, which is not shared, this forum is chaired by the two national security advisors, that will open up gradually um, more Indian access uh, to high technology, advanced technology from the United States. In the whole game of artificial intelligence and all the changes that uh, we are seeing, uh, I think India and United States can be strong partners. In fact, the most effective partners. And behind all this, of course, is the China factor. Because United States knows that their biggest challenger is China. Now, which country in the world can, can, can actually stand up to China effectively? It's only India. And not only in Asia, in the entire world. See, Japan and... Uh, Why do you say that? You, they're all small countries. I mean, they, they have no independent uh, power of their own. They're allies of the United States. United States does with them what they want. Similarly, South Korea and uh, Philippines and ASEAN, they're small countries. Uh, so which is the other country? Europe is very divided on how to deal with China. Uh, Germany is very dependent on China. Uh, it wants to become more dependent. Uh, France and others also want to continue to do business with China, the biggest, second largest economic power, largest exporter in the world, uh, challenging them in so many areas. They, they want to maintain a level of engagement uh, with China. In fact, the, the, if China's economy really goes into the doldrums, there will be a huge effect on the prosperity and living standards of the West. Uh, so, so th these are so the only country that can stand up in terms of uh, uh, size, human potential, a, a growing military power, growing economic power, civilizational depth, cultural depth uh, is India, and therefore uh, they would have interest in uh, in uh, working with India. Uh, to shape security, especially in the maritime area, uh, hence the Indo-Pacific concept and the Quad, uh, 
And then in the West Asia, we have the ITU2 and the uh, IMEC, the India Middle East Econ Europe Economic Corridor, which currently will be put on hold because of what is happening in Gaza. But you can see the kind of uh, uh, connectivity, uh, cooperation, uh, and, and security cooperation, especially in the maritime space that the two countries are working together with, uh, is necessary for us and for them uh, to contain the threat from China, which is which is real. So that's all from my side, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, do you have any concluding remarks? Well, my concluding remarks uh, would be that uh, I hope that in the next election, JB uh, gets a clear majority. Now, I don't know about the numbers, but it should have a clear majority of its own. Because uh, this Amrit Kal business uh, will not uh, actually uh, be uh, leveraged for our future uh, unless uh, we have a stable, strong government at the center. Now, Modi has laid out a vision for India, which combines both economic growth and welfare, uh, as well as technological advance, as well as self-sufficiency. Uh, so all these things uh, need uh, stability and continuity in policy. Uh, so that is uh, one. And the second is that uh, uh, we need uh, to be able to get the maximum from our demographic, demographic dividend. We uh, must kill our population. It's very young. The median age is just 28.80 years or something. So we have another 20 years of this. And if we can leverage this and convert this into a public good, as we say, with all the aging economies, developed economies, we have a very strong hand to play. And then the kind of uh, things we are doing in terms of uh, opening the startups and opening our space to the private sector, defense to the private sector, these kind of fundamental changes that are taking place, a lot more has to be done still. But some of the fundamental changes that are taking place is putting us uh, on the road uh, to becoming uh, one of the credible major powers uh, of the world. Uh, there it is. So this is uh, what I would like to say in terms of what I hope and wish for. I hope all your wishes come true. And I thank you once again for being on my show and your contributions to nation building keep guiding us. And I look forward to speak to you again. It was a great privilege to have you today. Thank you so much. Namaste. Enjoy. My, my pleasure. Bye-bye. Bye, sir.